In this video, we're going over 10 of the most interesting new systems coming in Shadowlands. Starting off at number 10, we have the Maw. This realm of death acts as the worst place within the Shadowlands, and because of that, this place has a fair few cool new systems introduced to it. First off, we've had many zones in the past where you cannot fly, while you can in the rest of the expansion. Quell Danas for TBC, Tolbarad for Cataclysm, Isle of Giants, Thunder Isle, the Timeless Isle for Pandaria, Ashran for Draenor, and Argus for Legion. However, unlike all of those zones, you cannot mount in the Maw at all, flying or ground. Yes, even though the zone is outdoors, you cannot mount there. This makes the zone quite a bit more active, as instead of simply mounting up and running from location to location, outrunning any mobs you pull, you need to actually fight anything you encounter, instead of just outrunning them. That, or try anyways and risk dying. Which is a very bad thing in the Maw, as everything you do there earns you a new currency called Stygia, which can be spent at a local broker. But anytime you die, half of your Stygia is dropped, and in a reference to the Dark Souls series, you can recover it by going back to your body and clicking on your corpse, as when you die, you respawn at the base. No walking back to your body. The next big thing is a mechanic called the Eye of the Jailer. This prevents you from spending all day in the Maw. And how does it do that? Well, as you spend time there, it very slowly powers up, greatly powering up when you kill rares, collecting treasures, and complete dailies. Then, as the eye fills up, it gains ranks. At rank 1, soul seeker mobs that commonly patrol, once neutral, now turn hostile. And upon being seen by them, they'll call nearby allies to assist in fighting you. Rank 2 will cause towers floating around the maw to barrage you once in a while. Being hit deals heavy damage and chains you to the ground, needing to click the chains to free yourself. Rank 3 will start spawning assassins to attack you sometimes when you enter combat. Rank 4 will send elite assassins sometimes when you enter combat. Then the final rank, 5, will apply a growing debuff. This debuff will start by slowing you in combat and increasing damage taken. This debuff will grow very quickly, meaning you just need one or two more mobs and you are done, you are good. But to try to stay too long and you're going to just get instantly killed soon. So at this point, it's best to finish up what you're doing and get out of there with your Stygia safe. We have never had a zone locked behind anything like this before, nor have we really had a zone that was unsafe to be in. We have had environmental threats before, like the Argus Fell Tornadoes or Praxis Barrage, but nothing to this level. And at number 9, we have the new leveling systems. First off, for those of you who don't know, the current max level of 120 is being reduced to 50, with level 60 being the new max level of Shadowlands. Now that that's out of the way, in Legion they introduce scaling content, with each zone scaling with your level, allowing you to choose to level in any of the Legion zones in any order, except the max level Siramar, of course. Then in BFA they made it so this affected all old zones as well, allowing people to level in whatever zones they want, and with some expansion choice. However, with Shadowlands, they are inverting it. Shadowlands zones are not going to scale, each one is set in their order. However, the new Threads of Fate will allow any alts once you reach a leveled character through the normal storyline in Shadowlands, allows you to choose which of the zones you wish to start in, and do your entire leveling system in a way that means you can only work on endgame content, like rep, unlocks, and more while leveling. But that's not all. They also took the old world scale into BFA and changed it to something new called Chromie Time. When you start the game as a new player, you'll be sent to the new starting zone, made for new characters to introduce into the game, and even a mini dungeon. After that, they'll be sent to do the most recent last expansion main story, and this will allow them to level all the way from fresh out of the starting zone up to level 50. Then after that, any players who have a character at level 50 and above will be able to choose their normal starting zone, or the new starting zone upon creating their character, and once they are complete, they go to Chromie and activate Chromie time, allowing you to pick any expansion you want to level through. Got a level 10 DK? Go to Northrend and level from min to max in about 10 hours, all in Northrend. Got an Orc Warrior? Choose Draenor and level fully in Draenor. Got a Warlock? Legion, so on and so forth. You can do whatever expansion you want to level with. So for the first time in many years, we can now complete an expansion's main storyline without out-leveling it. Leveling is both faster and with far more options. And at number 8, we have the Great Vault. Since the introduction of Mythic Plus and Legion, we've had weekly chests which give you loot based on your highest completed key. With Warlords of Draenor, we got the Garrisons, which had bi-weekly missions that give you a piece of raid gear based on your highest cleared raid difficulty. Continued in Legion, but discontinued in BFA. BFA also removed PvP vendors, giving PvP a weekly chest, as well as a weekly progressing quest giving a set of selected items. 
But now, what happens when we mix all of those things together? Well, we get the new weekly vault. This vault has three sections, PvP, M+, and Raiding. Starting with zero options, you need to unlock the vault over the course of the week. By clearing raid bosses, you unlock up to three slots. By clearing Mythic Plus, you unlock another three. And by doing PvP, you unlock another three. This means if you do raiding, PvP, and Mythic Plus all in one week, you can have up to nine options to choose from at the end of the week. These items will be based on which row they're in and what difficulty content you did. Higher keys, higher raid difficulty, and higher rating. And then you get to either choose one of those up to nine times. Or you can say no and exchange the choice for an important currency. This weekly vault returns a way for raiders to get passive guaranteed items like the other two styles of play. Plus finally, we get to choose from multiple items instead of being forced into one random item every week. Made even better for PvPers as the PvP vendors are back. And at number 7, we have a super simple concept, but still great in its own way, and that's Renown. Renown is the new version of Reputation. While Reputation still exists in Shadowlands, it's not as important as it was in past expansions, at least for character progression. Renown allows Blizzard to better control how Reputation-based progressions are obtained. First, removing the metagaming of the Human Racial and Darkmoon Fair buff meaning the rate of obtaining will be the exact same for all players. No more Alliance players get a head start because of being a human. It also allows for us to get away from the boring 3, 6, 12, 21k reputation levels we've always been stuck with. The final benefit is that every level of renown we actually get a reward, allowing you to know that you're getting something every single level, as most reputations don't really give you anything until you hit Exalted. And with that, you have something you can always work towards and always see visible in the renown UI, instead of being stuck to no rewards coming at friendly, honored, reverted, and exalted, or at weird reputation numbers. Next is number six, and that is the mission table. Two, or three, or four. We'll just call it the auto battle or mission table. We're all used to the mission table at this point, introduced in Warlords of Draenor Garrisons, and then again in the Draenor Shipyard, changed slightly in Legion, and then again in BFA. However, at this point, it is obvious they are not quite that much of a hit. So, now what? Well, make it fun, or at least interesting and interactive. Instead of the simple rock-paper-scissors countering, you now have an actual battle system. With followers who have abilities like AoE heals, a massive burst of single-target damage, or taunting, so, yes, they have the roles of a tank heal, range DPS, melee DPS, and with this, you can place them in an order of a typical five-person party, with three in front, two in the back, and build a little dungeon party to send off to do a fight. Then, when they come back, you'll be able to see their fight, a simple but fun animation of two groups fighting one another. You can even speed it up or outright skip it if you wish, all for them to gain levels while you also gain rewards for yourself. Like the past mission tables, it will mostly just be currency or experience if you're leveling up still, and the typical random items needed for quests here and there. It is quite a fun change to the slog fest of the old ones, just hopefully we won't need an add-on to get through it like we did in the past. And at number 5 is the face feature of Shadowlands, the Covenant system, or more so the specific thing of Covenant abilities. As if we included all Covenant stuff in one number, most of the video would just be that one number. There is four covenants, the Kirin of Bastion, the Necro Lords of Maldraxxus, the Night Fey of Ardenwald, and the Venthyr of Revendreth. As you level through Shadowlands, you'll work with these covenants, and then once you reach max level, you're forced to choose one of the covenants to commit your assistance to. While leveling, you unlock two abilities, and of course, once you reach max level, joining a specific covenant locks you to that covenant's abilities. These two abilities are first, one that is the same for all classes, Bastion summons a Steward, which gives you special potions and allows you to change talents. Maldraxxus allows you to use a channeled ability to give yourself a large shield, increasing by using the ability in your corpses. Ardenwald allows you to transform into an animal form, much like the Ghost Wolf form for shamans, giving you a speed boost and also a few uses of weaker Mage Blinks. You can even customize the animal to be many different appearances. Lastly, Revendreth allows players to do a target to teleport, an ability many of the community have called insanely overpowered. The second ability is one based on your class and covenant. So while everyone who is Necrolord will have the covenant ability Fleshcraft, a Necrolord DK will have a different second ability than a Necrolord Warlock. And also a Necrolord DK will have both abilities different than a Venthyr DK. The key thing is these abilities and other things alongside them are locked behind changing covenants, taking quite the while. Something we have not had for a long time in WoW. 
a system that tells you that if you choose something, you will have a hard time changing it. Although joining a new covenant is easy, rejoining a covenant you have left in the past will be hard. Almost like a far more unique version of the Aldar and Scryers of TVC. And at number 4 is another section of the covenants, and that being the Soul Bind Trees. Inside the Shadowlands, souls are able to bind to each other, empowering each other in their own special ways. Bounded together, they are stronger than before, and with this comes quite interesting benefits. Currently, soul binds are locked to being changed weekly. However, in each covenant, there are three soul bind trees, each of them different from the others that allows you to make one for each of your specs, if you really wish to change specs often. Well, unless you're a druid or a demon hunter. These trees start with one option, but as you gain renown and complete the campaign, you unlock more trees, and allow you to go further down said trees. These trees act like old talent trees, starting from the top and going to the bottom, although you can only select one per row, so it seems a mix of current and old talent trees. Inside of these trees are two types of options. First, there is, well, just talents, things that are generic and everyone shares between them, like when you hit, you have a chance to deal damage to all nearby enemies. But then there is the conduit slots. These slots can be filled with the conduits, like essences that are obtained and learned by doing content all around the game, and have different uses. Although, unlike essences, these are specific to your class and even your spec. So let's go over one of my favorite soulbind trees and talk about it. As you can see with the Bonesmith Hermir, she starts off with two options, leading to different types of conduits, then filtering into one before splitting to three again, then filtering back to one, splitting to two, then filtering back to one final talent. These range from choices of thorns, reducing fleshcraft cooldown, crit chance, passive self-heal, small movement speed, mount speed boosts, passive mineral slash jewel collection, and finishing off an ability that on death allows you to continue to act for 10 seconds, although at half damage and healing, but hey, need 10 seconds to tank a boss and about to die? This ability will save you. And as for conduits, well those are just far too many to list. But a few examples for Warlock is like giving your Deathstalkers a chance to attack twice, increasing the damage of your Felguard, or reducing the cooldown of certain abilities. And at number 3, we had to include, every expansion has legendaries, and Shadowlands is no different. However, we obtain these in quite a different way. First, you must collect Soul Ash, then you must collect legendary powers. These are obtained from all sorts of content in World of Warcraft, and these are unlocked account-wide even though there is many generic class and spec based powers. After that you need to go to a crafter and get the armor pieces you wish to make legendary. Then a scribe to get stat scrolls, allowing you to choose the two stats you want your legendary to have. Then once you have all these collected, you go to the runesmith, a legendary smith who is able to enchant your gear within the Shadowlands. Putting all of these together you are able to craft a custom legendary of your wish. Powers have specific slots they can go into, but other than that, two warlocks could have the same legendary power but in different slots, or different legendary powers in the same slot. This brings us the Shadowlands versions of legendaries, many legendaries with little powers, however a much better way of obtaining them as you are in full control. Plus many of these powers are quite fun, based on a mix of old tier sets, old talents, legendaries, and even new ones. For example, the Death Knight Super Strain, which when you apply to your spec specific plague, it also applies the other two specs plagues. Soulforged Embers for Hunters allows them to fire a flare into their tar trap to burn everything within that trap. Trirune Ward allows mages who cast the respective Magic Ward to gain the ward of the other two specs as well. Or Druid's Verdant Infusion, allowing Swiftmen to extend the duration of Hots. And at number 2, we have Torgos, the Infinite Tower of the Damned. Torgos is a new mode of content in Shadowlands with two purposes. Receiving the currency used for legendary crafting called Soul Ash, and for cosmetics, pets, mounts, transmog, and more. The mode is a new type of roguelite content where you enter an infinite tower and go through floors finding mobs and exploring mazes. These floors become harder and harder as you travel. However, what makes this possible is while you travel you find anima, floating orbs that allow you to select different powers, all the way from simple damage buffs to stuff like a death knight being able to apply all three different plagues at once, instead of being limited to the plague for your spec, the same as the power of the legendary that I explained before. Or another, being unable to walk as a mage, now relying on spamming blink to move. We have a video on some of the coolest neutral powers you can find in the description below, with many more videos about Torgos to come. This is the biggest new feature simply because of how different and exciting it is. 
My editor has spent nearly a thousand hours in the Infinite Tower already, just doing the Alpha and Beta. With so many different options and quick, exciting combat, this place will be the figurehead of the expansion, especially since they made Torgos able to be done for free. It once required a key, which was obtained through doing dailies within the Maw. Now it has infinite entries, leaving the Maw with little use right now. So, if you want to spend all day every day doing Torgos, you can. Then for number one, let's talk about another Covenant feature. Each of the Covenants in Shadowlands have their own style for many different things. First, they have the different mounts and transmogs, as well as abilities and soul binds, obviously. But on top of that, they have different upgrades. Each of them have a way to get around their respective zones, a necropolis, blood mirrors, anima network, or a mycelium system. However, each Covenant has one big difference that is far from any other. Their facility. While we could mention all four, like the Soul Garden of Ardenwald, the Vampire Party of Revendreth, and the Boss Rush Trial of Kyrian, however, we are going to go over the most in-depth one we found, with the most unique and interesting mechanics, that being the build -a bomb or as it's known in-game, the Abomination Factory. This structure is built in the Sanctum and upgraded as well as giving access to new recipes. There is a few different types of recipes you can create at this factory, first being the abominations themselves. These amalgamations of soul and flesh are the only way for many souls of Maldraxxus to obtain a body, and so we must give them a body. The first you make is Chorty, a lanky creature that was seemingly a grumble in life, and because of this he is obsessed with the Lucky Dew. And with that you're able to tell him to hunt down a pile of goods that contain grace, and sometimes flesh, which is used for crafting more abominations. Each abomination you craft will have different uses, from Flytrap who acts as a faster than normal mount, however with some startup time, but it does even work in combat, to Atticus who sells you rare items used for quests, rare recipes, and mounts and pets for extra flesh, to Rose Boyle acting as a healer and many others filling the roles of tank, melee DPS, and ranged DPS for world content, even to Nax allowing them and their ally to go in stealth. Each of these abominations has a weekly quest of their own, giving you rare parts needed for later abominations. The second type of item you can craft is some undead pets and mounts, as well as some wrappings that you can use to summon a large bone warden to cause havoc amongst the enemies outside the Maldraxxus space. The third type of item you can craft is a cosmetic for your abominations. These items are crafted once you can unlock the appearances for all of your abominations. These include a hat slot like helmets, holiday hats, candles, crowns, top hats, and more. Then there's the back slot for things like flags, banners, wings, backpacks, armor, and more. Then there's the shoulder slot for, well, shoulder pads, toys, and pets like a cute little slide kitten, as well as some accessories too. And those range into a whole bunch of other things. During Warlords of Draenor, we had the bodyguards, a few characters that were able to help you in combat, out in the world. Then in Legion, each class had their own bodyguard. However, only a couple are able to actually help fight, the rest just being active abilities. But with the new Abomination Factory, for the first time ever, we have so many choices. And with that wide variety of uses, roles, niches, abilities, and with all of that, the ability to customize them on top of it, making your abominations different from everyone else's, and dress them how you feel like they should be dressed, or well, how you would like them to be dressed. Alright, and that's the list. Lots of new content coming in Shadowlands, especially so if you play all four Covenants on alts. This video was edited by my editor, Felplague, who plays the beta non-stop. And also, fun fact, did you know only 34.8% of people who watch these videos are actually subscribed to the channel?